Thanks everyone for coming. It is such a pleasure to have Chef Andrew Carmelini here at Google New York. Welcome. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm having this very James Lipton moment right now. I feel like we're like, so tell me about your 12-year-old uh, performance in Annie. Um, anyway, so Chef Carmelini has trained throughout the uh, great restaurants of Italy and New York from Michelin two-star San Domenico in Emilio Romagna to Les Pinas to Le Cirque in New York. Mm -hmm. um, he spent six years at Cafe Boulud, winning a James Beard Award for Rising Star Chef of the Year and was added to Food & Wine Magazine's Best New Chef roster. In his last month at Cafe Boulud, he was awarded Best Chef New York City by the James Beard Foundation. Uh, he then went on to open a voce in 2006, earning a three-star review from the New York Times, his first Michelin star, and a James Beard Award, a James Beard Award nomination for Best New Restaurant in 2007. And in 2008, he published his first book of recipes and stories with his wife, Urban Italian, and his second cookbook, uh, American Flavor, just came out this week, which a lot of you hopefully got in the audience. Um, Chef Carmelini also owns two highly celebrated restaurants, one of my personal favorites in New York, La Conda Verde, that's just my plug to get a table, in the Greenwich Hotel in Tribeca. It might work. It does work, I know. <laughs> that's all up here. Um, and that has two stars from the New York Times and was also nominated by the James Beard Foundation for Best New Restaurant in 2009. They like me. They do, I know. What's with the foundation? And also the Dutch in Soho. And he is opening a second location of the Dutch just in a couple of weeks, it sounds like. Next month. Next month. Yeah. So there you go. So he's very busy. And we're excited that you made time to come here to Google. So thank you for that. Thanks for having me. Um, no, it's a pleasure. And you obviously have this incredible laundry list of accomplishments. Um, so I thought we could just go through them one by one. No. Uh, that sounds <laughs> awful. <laughs> um, OK, so how did you get into cooking? Um, uh, you know, I was either going to be a, a rock star or I was going to be a chef. Uh, you know, in the late, I started uh, cooking when just kind of, I mean, it's a little bit cliche, but, you know, I just started cooking with my mom and my grandmother, and I just, I really liked it. Um, you know, in the 70s when I grew up, um, you know, there was that whole health food thing going on. Mm -hmm. You know, there was uh, carob and wheat germ, and, like, my mom was kind of like into that, and they wanted, they didn't want to eat processed foods, and they didn't want to, they just liked good food, and we had a garden in the back, and this is long before the word foodie even existed, um, and there wasn't kind of like that hyper restaurant culture and kind of chef culture that exists today, which is great, mm -hmm. but they just, they just wanted good, good food, and they, um, I think were big influences on me because to get me into cooking. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I was also a musician, and I was either going to go to Berkeley School of Music or I was going to go to cooking school. And I'm not sure still to this day why I went to cooking school <laughs> besides uh, I'm actually glad I didn't go to music school back then because it was uh, 1989. It was pre-grunge, and hair was very long still, and uh, I'm glad I didn't go that route. Because <laughs> who knows what would happen today. Right. Well, so was there one dish that sort of inspired your love of food? Maybe the carob and the kale? No, no, no carob. <laughs> um, you know, the... You know, I used, to, I used to like baking, actually, when I was a kid, too, just because I have a crazy sweet tooth, and uh, still today, that's why... Uh, I'm blessed with two amazing pastry chefs at both restaurants. That's mostly for my own satisfaction. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I just, I, I just really like, you know, like a cherry pie. <laughs> that was like, you know, I grew up in the Midwest and uh, it's kind of like that iconic kind of, uh, you know, it's just I don't know, something very satisfying right. about. That's why at the Dutch, that restaurant was built just for pie. Because at the time, nice. you know, there wasn't, uh, I don't know, no one was doing pies anymore. So and that's... Uh, that was a big inspiration behind it. So what was your inspiration, speaking of that, about, for the book, for the new book? You know, the book, uh, it's not a restaurant cookbook. Uh, like Urban Italian, my first book, um, I mean, I have, I don't know, 500 plus cookbooks from around the world. And uh, I, they're, not, they're not chef cookbooks, even mm -hmm. though I'm a chef. You know, my wife, uh, Gwen Hyman, wrote the book, also Urban Italian with me. Mm -hmm. And that process for us is, um, you know, in our New York City apartment kitchen, she is on her laptop next to me, and I am in the kitchen. And uh, we make every single recipe together. And since she's not a chef, uh, she needs to measure things, and she doesn't have that kind of instinct to just kind of throw something together. So, you know, she is making me, she wants to make sure that anyone can make it, or like right. when you make it, or I make it, or someone else makes it, it's gonna work. And so that's kind of, 
both books really, or not, they're not restaurant cookbooks, but they tell kind of a story of um, um, what's influenced me over the years, or just like right. what kind of like gets me cooking really. And so, um, you know, American Flavor really is that kind of journey of being an American chef. And it's a little bit of like, I think, uh, Chefs born in America are kind of afraid to use that word, like I'm an American chef, because if you add, there's like a little, it's a little bit of a, I don't know, it's not flattering in some ways, I think, or it's. Why do you uh, think that? I don't know. I just think that you know, American cooking, we don't, we're not blessed with, uh, you know, a thousand years of history, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like France or China, uh, in that, in that, in that term, and so. Uh, American cooking, I think American cooking now is the modern kind of look at it. Um, it's it's a combination of all this kind of root inspired cooking. It's kind of like what your grandmother was mm -hmm. cooking, what my grandmother was cooking, but not mixed. Probably not what my you know. grandmother was cooking. I'm, <laughs> guessing. I'm just guessing. What, 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 what was that actually? She wasn't, well, she wasn't doing a lot of the cooking probably. Okay. That's part of it. I think her daughter in laws, including my mother, were probably doing it. But um, it was Indian stuff, mm -hmm. but in India. Right. So not in America. So, but still that, you know, the influence, <laughs> if you're cooking at home, that's what? It's Italian food. It's Italian. But I'm Indian, I know, it doesn't make any sense. Right. My grandmother was Italian, but she Made lived. Indian food. But she, uh, well. <laughs> that um, would be weird, right? <laughs> that, would, that, that would be really strange. Um, <laughs> they, they were in Miami in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Mm -hmm. And Miami back then was a southern town. Uh, it was kind of like Mobile, Alabama, more than it is the kind of the Mamia today. And so they would, you know, she was Italian, but she made uh, eventually was cooking, and um, up until she passed away, was cooking on New Year's Eve. She would cook black beans, uh, black eyed peas, and she would cook. She would make biscuits and she would make pies. And so you know, you have that kind of um, uh, that both those things going yeah. on at the same time. Yeah, I mean, my mother would make Indian food with oregano, which is. Not a traditional Indian spice, from what I understand. Like dal with oregano. Yeah, because like, like, it was they didn't get all the spices here back in that. It's very so, fusion. So. It's very fusion. She was fusion yeah. before fusion was fusion. So she's a really a, a she's she's super, a trendsetter. Yeah, she was a foodie back then. <laughs> um, so about the book, what's your favorite recipe in the book, or do you have a favorite recipe? Uh, you know the kind of like the menus at both restaurants. I like to have like something for everybody, mm -hmm. and it kind of just depends what you're in the mood for, really. Uh, you know, the, so there's going to be something like there's a lot of vegetables inside the book, but there's also what I would say is like a ridiculous over the top American dish, which is um, it's a barbecued meatloaf that has um, macaroni and cheese stuffed inside it. <laughs> that sounds awesome. <laughs> which is like, that's it's so, like, so wrong, it's right. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, one of, it's one of those dishes that's like so wrong, it's so right. So we have, you know, I have. Uh, you know, there's a there's a dish of you know organic red quinoa with uh, wild rice and pecans and some other stuff, and then there's also whiskey, you know I the believe whiskey, yeah, whiskey, yeah, whiskey, which is uh, yeah. it's it's healthy and not healthy at the yeah, same exactly. time because it's all about balance. <laughs> okay. uh, but I don't know the the meatloaf thing is kind of fun because it's kind of a cool technique that you can totally do at home and then bring it to the table and cut it and people are going to be like, whoa, <laughs> <laughs> what's happening? Like, so what's the technique? Uh, you know, you just kind of like make a, you make the macaroni and then you roll it into a uh, kind of like log and then put it in the freezer. And then you make your meatloaf and then you take out the frozen log and you kind of wrap it around it and you bake it. You glaze it with this homemade barbecue sauce and it has some other stuff inside it too. But it works out where the temperature of the macaroni and cheese mm -hmm. just oozes out perfectly as the meatloaf <laughs> is cooked. It's so good. I'm really hungry. Yeah. I know. I should it's kind of like molecular gastronomy today. with no chemicals. It's right. just, uh, just about temperature. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so obviously we're here in New York and you mentioned your tiny New York kitchen of which many of us share that challenge. Mm -hmm. what, what do you recommend? What from the book is easy enough to make in a tiny New York kitchen? Can you make meatloaf stuffed with macaroni and cheese in it? Again, like that's tricky? what I I I made everything at my, right. in, in, my in my in my kitchen and uh, uh, so I tried to like yeah I remember with Urban Italian my first book the I'm fortunate enough at the restaurant that I don't have to do dishes anymore like when I first started the business I was definitely washing dishes and uh, you have to remember that when you're a chef you know for a lot of years it was always I was cooking at home and it was like 15 pots. And right. like, you want to do this, you want to do that. So we try to make, at the, but for the home versions of everything, I try to do everything with one or two pots or one pot and a pan, you know, so you don't have to 
that's the worst. You know, yeah. you make the whole dinner and you got to deal with like the cleanup afterwards. So that's what my husband's clean up for. as you go. Clean up it's as really you go. important. Make or dirty have a husband who will do dishes, who's so particular about cleanliness. You're very gendered about you, these things. I know. <laughs> no, because yeah, that's true. I do the cooking and he does the cleaning. It's a good division of that's a, that's a good division. Yeah, that's okay. And sometimes if, cooking involves ordering. I would I would take that. I would I would take I would take that role if you cook for me every night. Right. Well, or order. I can call up at, like with the restaurant. Okay, so tell us more about the restaurants. We're speaking of those. Uh, Lacanda Verde and the Dutch. You How know the um, Lacanda Lacanda Verde is. Um, uh, originally, I was going to open up a little pasta bar on 10th Street uh, between 2nd and 3rd, and uh, uh, Bob De Niro has the Granite Hotel, and they were having some problems there with the restaurant there, uh, and I started talking to them about doing something there, and that's kind of how La Conda came to be, and I just wanted, like, La Conda Verde and the Dutch, really, because for a long time I did uh, really high-end French and Italian food. <laughs> Um, uptown and it was great and I, I like that you know to like be able to give that people that experience but I always lived downtown but I was always working uptown and I just you know for me uh, in my ripe old age of 35 when I did Lakanda Verde I just wanted a restaurant the corner New York City restaurant that was you could stop by any time of day and so that's kind of the spirit at both places but one's Italian and one is American and uh, you know just that sense that you can come at noon and get a bowl of pasta and a glass of wine and split, or you can come on Saturday night, you know, with your wife or your friends or whatever and like go crazy, or you can just stop by at six with clients or just, I like that idea that restaurants kind of have that, it's like a tie to the community and it just becomes all day right. kind of, um, you know, just serves like a lot of different, a lot of different needs. And uh, yeah, it brings like the crazy energy to it also. You know, you just kind of get an eclectic group of people that are, you know, dying there for different reasons. And that's kind of what I wanted to do at both restaurants. And do you think you could not have done that same restaurant in a different location? Like, what was special about, apart from... I think, you know, New, it's, it's funny, because one restaurant, uh, the Dutch is in Soho, and right. La Conde Verde is in Tribeca. Tribeca is so different from Soho. It's, and I didn't even realize that, didn't even notice the differences really until I opened up the Dutch, and like, you just saw the people that were walking by, and just saw the kind of like the, the, the cycle and the rhythm of the of the neighborhood, right. uh, and that you know is it's it's neighborhood, but it's also destination. You know, so I like to have like both those things going on. Right. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, a couple of off-topic questions. What do you eat when no one else is looking? What do I eat when no one else is looking? Yeah. I am not embarrassed by any foods. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be something. Uh, you know, I don't know, like something uh, you don't want to tell your chef friends. Uh, what do I eat when I'm cooking? I don't know. Like I would happily eat like a Twix bar right now if you wanted. <laughs> like a like a challenge? Like I don't, I don't think I've, does anyone have one? I don't think we have them. No, I I, I I don't know. I think you know that even if you're even if you're working at a three-star Michelin restaurant or you're you're cooking, um, um, you know, uh, whatever you're doing really, I think uh, you have you know. I think there's no, it doesn't matter if it's Twix bar or it's like a chocolate souffle. I think it's like the, for me it's the same really. It's the kind of same emotional response. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what do you eat from the walk-in? What do I eat for the walk-in? You know, these days I try to eat an apple once in a while. It's very healthy. You know, just try to uh, eat, eat apple and stay away from, you know, because I'll probably have, a, you know, I'll have a slice of steak upstairs, I'll have a, like a piece of this, so if I go downstairs, I'll eat, a, I'll eat an apple. Wine saps are very good right now. Uh, what, what are they? Wine sap. What's a wine sap? It's a variety of apple. comes from upstate. Oh, it's a type of apple. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. They have very good eating apples. Huh. As opposed to what apples? A cooking apple. A cooking apple. Yeah. <laughs> As one you can just pick up or one you can bake. There's a big difference. Apples. I did not know that. Apples are not apples. <laughs> just complicated my trip to the farmer's market mm. measurably. All right. Um, is there any culinary mountain you want to climb? Like something um, that you've always wanted to mountain. do? You know, I'd like to do a French restaurant one day. Uh, you know, French food, kind of like American food, like, or just the idea of American food is like, especially French, because um, it's a little bit out of fashion a little bit. And uh, I, I kind of want, I love, I mean, France is it's such an amazing culinary uh, journey, really, in all the different regions. And I kind of want to revisit that. Uh, and do that one day. Probably not on a super high-end level, 
more of an approachable level, but I want to kind of uh, get back to the country that first kind of inspired me like with cooking, which was France first, even before Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I'd like to do something, um, something French. Hmm. Yeah. Right. Are there any unexpected influences in your cuisine? Um, well, it's interesting because uh, the for you know, for example, there's an Indian technique called turka, mm -hmm. where you kind of will heat up ghee and then kind of bloom spices in it, uh, sometimes mustard seeds, and it's interesting to take like that technique and apply it to a sauce some, from someone else or some other kind of country that, but it's not fusion necessarily. So, for example. Um, if you were to make like a sauce moutarde or like a mustard sauce mm -hmm. that would go with like fish or meat in French cooking, you, the way to approach that really is that you take that technique, you know, of turka and taking mustard seeds and kind of like blooming them a little bit um, and making them pop and then doing that with like maybe a French sauce. So you're not really, again, it's not fusion in the sense that you're mixing curry powder with right. mustard with, um, you know, uh, some kind of French preparation. It's more like taking this particular technique and applying it to a sauce to even make it better, even though it comes from another culture, uh, which is kind of interesting. So, in, for example, like the fat French sauce, you might have your like gloss de viande and you might add some reduced cream to it and then finish it with Dijon mustard. Mm -hmm. Here, you can take that turka and kind of um, make those mustard seeds pop in the hot ghee. You might not use ghee for that sauce, but you just right. use butter and then add your your glass to beyond, and then add your kind of, so it's, I look at food that way sometimes, you know, and that balance of say like the sweet and sour in uh, Thai food mm -hmm. or Vietnamese food, you can apply to Italian food. Not that you can use fish sauce in Italian food, but you know, just balsamic vinegar and olive oil. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, that's what I, I kind of look for parallels that way. Mm -hmm. uh, um, what challenges you? People. <laughs> Like right now. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, a person made me happy today because in an email exchange uh, last year uh, with someone that had a very nice meal at La Conde Verde and was telling me about um, limoncello that someone in their family made, uh, a nice uh, gentleman brought me some of that homemade limoncello today. Is that that? That's is that. that this is not Orangina. This is limoncello. You're just going to pound it? Uh, I can tell you from experience. It's that not it's, not a good idea. I know, it's not a good idea. Uh, there was I can an tell you from experience. Yeah, too. there was there was an experience in Umbria once that it's not a good idea to chug limoncello. It's for sipping purposes only. So you're just you just have that just in case. This is my prop. Goes, yeah, if things right. get, if things get if things get crazy, we're gonna <laughs> just just bust it open if this isn't going well. Um, what? So you already told me that you'd be a rock star. What would you play? You uh, well, that's changed. It's 1988. Um, if I would have a band today. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have, a, I have a studio in my house and uh, I, I have everything from vintage keyboards to um, MPC players and vinyl. And uh, I mean, I started as a guitarist, but I've fallen in love with hip hop and trip hop and beats and that kind of thing. So um, that's where I spend all my money and time. So but, you'd be like a rap star? No, absolutely not. <laughs> I'm an I'm a, I'm a awful, awful, awful rapper. But I'm totally gonna make you do one at the end. I'm, of the song. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, you'll, I'm a, you'll have a couple minutes. I'm a very, I'm a very bad rapper. I'm all about the music part. All right. Yeah, don't ask me to rhyme. So if we, if I we can barely beat, spell. You went into it. All right. Uh, I'm not. I'm gonna let you off the hook, only because I want that table. Um, <laughs> what is the best meal you've ever had? You know, the best uh, meal I ever had. You know, th that's it's it's such a tough question because. I've had a lot of great meals. I'm very fortunate to have a lot of great meals, you know, and it kind of, I think it's the best meal you ever have is, you know, it's on different planes, really. So you could say, you know, I, I went to El Belief four times, and those were the four best meals I ever you did? had. But you went to El Belief four times? I could say I went to El Belief oh. four times, but I did not. Oh. I went three times, but uh, that's. <laughs> I, I went actually the in, the, in, the, in the early 90s, but kind of before um, he was really known and before he was using chemicals and stuff like that. So I've seen kind of the evolution mm -hmm. over, over time. Um, you know, that's a meal as performance art and kind of a meal as discovery. And um, 
that's different than like having like an awesome out your, uh, outdoor barbecue or that can be a great meal because you're with awesome people and there's this, uh, this whole other layer of like the dining experience, uh, which is interesting too because in, for in Italy, for example, you can go to a Michelin starred restaurant and you can have kind of like the Alto Cucina experience and that's great. It might not be the best meal you ever had in your life because you know you, that might happen. That might be a spaghetti and clams you had at some trattoria, um, you know, in Ligoria somewhere. That's what it is for me. It's more. The, it's you know I love great food and I um, both in the high and both in the low. That Twix bar and that chocolate souffle. Mm -hmm. But really, I think a great meal is made up of it's so many so many other things. Right. Um, so can I pinpoint one like great meal? Um, uh, I don't know, that's a tough one. That could be, you know, breakfast uh, sushi at the Tokyo uh, fish market at six o'clock in the morning. Uh, or that could have been that spaghetti and clams in, at um, Bata Bota in Liguria. Right. Um, it's, it, it's, I'm fortunate to have that experience a lot. Right. Um, it also can be, I don't know, that bowl of oatmeal with your, <laughs> maybe not oatmeal, I'm sorry. <laughs> I take that back completely. That was completely off. <laughs> um, so what do you think of the whole molecular gastronomy trend? Because your, work, your food is um, so much more like rustic. I think of it as like very rustic and sort of almost like home cooking, but obviously elevated, but it's, there's something very approachable, I guess, about it. You know, I had, uh, just bringing up El Bulli, and it's one of the stories that's in American Flavor. I, uh, in, 90, in 1996, I was working in France, and uh, I, after a year, I took three months off and just traveled. Mm -hmm. And a couple of chefs said, go down to Spain, check this guy out, check this guy out. And I, I, went, I went, I went by myself, and um, I was the only person there for lunch. And you know, I, I was 25, I didn't really know what I was getting into. I thought I was gonna have paella and pan con tomate and all these kind of like classic Catalan dishes. And I sat down and we had 20 amuse bouche and there was all this, <laughs> there was all this stuff going on. Later, yeah. <laughs> and it was like a 35 course lunch and uh, it, was, it wasn't, it was, it was cooking, I'd never seen anything like it before and so I, I asked, like, I said, can I see the chef? And in my mind, for some reason, I thought it was going to be like a couple, because I was the only customer, I thought it would be just a couple guys in the kitchen, you know, banging it out, and, and the, the glass doors opened, and there was 40 people back there, and there were sculptures inside, and it was this, there was the first thing I noticed, there were no ovens inside the kitchen. And I was, I was like, what is this place? And so I met uh, Ferran, and he was lovely, and uh, I said, well, I'm not doing anything for the rest of the summer. Can I just stay here and work? He's like, I have too many people here. He goes, I'll tell you what, come back for lunch. And I couldn't even afford the gas to get back to, uh, to, to Rosas and at that point. And he's like, no, no, please come to lunch with my guest. And I took him up on it, and I slept in the car. And in the morning, I took a swim and put on my clothes from the day before and went for lunch, and he had put a table um, in the kitchen for two people and he was the second person and another 40 courses completely different from the day before came out it's amazing. Uh, and he sat down and ate every one with me and we just talked about food and what, his, what he was trying to do. This is kind of before um, he really had that international fame and started working with um, the chemicals and trying to change the perception of the diner uh, and change that kind of experience because uh, he was he was explained to me he was tired of going to France and um, um, you know going to the great restaurants and almost every menu was the same. Mm -hmm. um, so I had the experience very early on, but I didn't. I, it didn't speak to me as something I wanted to replicate um, or, or come back because really that uh, the soul there was a kind of a certain soul that I really liked about cooking and, and serving that type of food. So it was it was even though it was amazing and appreciated and I went back. Time, many times after that, and I know the techniques and learn them. It's not something that I'm, I um, wanted to copy. Right. Yeah, if that makes sense. So yeah. I appreciate that as a diner and as a chef, but it's not something I wanted to wanted to replicate. Yeah. Um, that's an extraordinary story. Yeah, it's cool, cool that's story. Pretty cool. Yeah. I wish. Uh, Dine out on that. I wish I took a picture of it because I didn't. It was like pre iPhone right. and. 
Yeah. Oh, okay. So talking mm -hmm. about that, what do you think about people who do that in your restaurants, like taking photographs of the food and tweeting it and? You know, I think in the beginning, it, uh, it really kind of bugged me out a little bit. Uh, you know, completely honest, it's like um, if I sat next to you when you were at your desk and like was like, wait, what are you doing? You know, what's that? What's that email He's, you just sent? So all those you know? people do that every day. They you know, sit the, there and uh, poke at me. It's annoying. You know, over <laughs> or, you know over over the, over the years, I've become more comfortable you know with it, and uh, it was uh, you know, especially when you first open too, because restaurants are so it's it's such a crazy experience, and every like there's a anticipate. I'm blessed with. Um, people wanting to come and experience that in the beginning, uh, but it's also maddening for me because it's, I mean, it's never, it's not, it's not like if you're a musician and you make this, your perfect song and you put it on a CD or you put it in MP3 and you can play it 10 years later and it's the same. Mm -hmm. It's, there's so many other factors. Uh, the fish came late, the temperature in the dining room was like two degrees more, uh, I'm in a bad mood, you're in a bad mood, there's all these other like non, there's all these other factors involved. Um, so, you know, that kind of like immediate reaction thing or the like pictures thing, it really, it would bug me out in the beginning when it first started to happen or that kind of like culture started to happen. Now I don't care. You go ahead and take pictures like you want. And we'll, I'll even come, we'll take a picture together in front of the meatball. Be like, hey. <laughs> you know, like, so well, I think it's part, of the, it's part of the social experience now. Um, it's part of, um, I mean, it's the same, like I'm, I love street art. So it's the same, I mean, if I, you know, go by and want to take a picture of this tag or you know that that illustration. It's it's the same. So I've I've uh, I've given it up. I've given up the hate. <laughs> um, so what do you what do you think about the use? Of, like, how's technology, if at all, affected the way you cook or the way maybe the way you wrote your book? We can start with that. Um, you know, the the I'm always um, I've always kind of been inspired, kind of what. Uh, your grandparents were cooking more than like what the great chefs were cooking. Uh, food for me is um, especially um, you, it's with, with travel especially is uh, I like the the anthropology of and discovery of food and how it relates to culture a little bit. So, you know, I've um, found inspiration in old Fanny Farmer cookbooks mm -hmm. and all you know. Uh, just you know, just translating old, uh, just old, old, older cookbooks to see kind of how things were done um, before. So, you know, because some things get forgotten. You know, there's one, um, there's one technique um, um, where you take. I, I love pickled cherries. It's a thing we use a lot, and we'll, you know, in the summertime or in in June when sour cherries come in, uh, we'll we'll pickle hundreds of pounds of sour cherries, and we'll use them for sauces and for garnishes and. Um, I discovered this is really cool technique where you save all the cherry pits and then you roast them in the oven and then crush them and then pickle the cherries with the cherry pits. You put them in a cloth and then, because the cherry pits have a kind of an almond flavor to them and it gives kind of this natural kind of like almond essence to the cherries. I mean, it's a very primitive kind of technique. You're taking the inside of this fruit and then roasting it and then crushing it and then pickling inside it as opposed to using technology to transform the cherry into something else and that kind of I know that's fascinating to me because it's not extracting I don't know it's just it's very elemental in a way and I, and I like that I like that kind of that, that approach to it um, so what's next for you as a chef what's next for me as a chef uh, I don't know uh, apart from the restaurant <laughs> opening obviously yeah no we're, we're doing and the, the book uh, you're busy you know that's <laughs> For me as a chef is just uh, you know the it's it's constantly evolving really and uh, because the restaurant so it's 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 a very organic thing and a very living thing it's you know the next thing is just it's you know next we're going to change some more fall menu items next week and we're going to do don't you know, take that ricotta off the menu what? I will hunt you down it's and like find it's the, you. the simplest dish we <laughs> ever ever did before the, like one of the most simplest things ever and it's the most popular. Thing we ever created. Have really. you guys had this? You must go leave the office right now. <laughs> I give you all permission. I have no authority to do so, but I give you permission. You must go and have it. It's amazing. Um, but that's, it's the a, most that's popular thing. That's, right? that's an example of something yeah. that can be like so. It can be really so simple, but so um, soul satisfying. And it's really just it's about the ingredients. We get the sheep milk ricotta because most ricotta is made from buffalo milk. I mean, um, cow milk. 
um, it's, it, which is delicious. It's just a, the sheep milk has a little bit more tanginess to it, and it comes from Sardinia, uh, northern Sardinia, um, the Pina brothers. They own, uh, it's like 400,000 sheep, um, of which I think I use 200,000 sheep, sheep yeah. because we sell, <laughs> we sell so much of it. Um, but we buy everything they import because we go through so much of it. Uh, so it's just highlighting that in an amazing way. So. It's, it's incredibly delicious. I dream about, about it. It's, I know, not normal, but it is really delicious. Okay. Um, how are we doing on time? So I want to make sure we leave time. OK, so we'll just do a few more questions before yeah, we okay. wrap up. So if I came to your house for dinner, what would you make? Um, invited or not invited? Uh, either way. <laughs> I'm getting your address after. <laughs> The last guest I had at my house um, was Wiley Dufresne, who's uh, the chef at WD50, and he's a neighbor of mine and a friend. And we, um, he came over the house, and um, his wife brought cookies, and I ordered, ordered Mortarino pizza. That'll do. And that, it cookies was, from Mrs. Dufresne and it was, um, pizza. That was, that was the last meal that was served at my house to a guest. Nice. Yeah. Sounds like you know, what's served at my house, not gonna lie. You know, the, um, uh, it's, it's the great thing about being in New York, you know, the, um, it's, um, you can get so many great things like so easily and you can, you can run out to Queens and get Thai food or you can go to Flushing and, you know, go to Golden Mall or you can, you know, run up and have a five course French meal if you want and just like there's so much access to, you know, that if, if I'm cooking at home though, my, my go, my go to is two things. It's, um, it's pasta with tomato sauce, uh, or it's uh, like a roast chicken and a salad. Big, huge salad and a roast chicken. So that's interesting, because that seems to influence the two restaurants. Like, it's Lokanda is your pasta with tomato sauce, and then right. roast chicken at the Dutch. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's the simple stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, so what, what would you recommend? What is your favorite restaurant that everyone should know about in New York, since we're in New York? Again, this, it's one of those questions because there's so many different levels of, you know. Like one that won't, people wouldn't necessarily know about, a little hidden gem that we're all going to turn up to on Well, it Saturday. goes back to that technology. <laughs> it goes back to that technology question, right. what restaurant haven't you heard about? That's probably true. You know, that's the, it's, you know, as soon as um, something is discovered. Somebody's tweeting about it. Somebody's tweeting about it or something. <laughs> you know, there's something, you know, it's, it's, which is, it's great. And at the same time, it's, you, it's, it, what is that place? Maybe we'll create it. Maybe we'll go out to like, you know, I don't know. No one will tell anybody. We'll go to Midwood <laughs> and we won't tell anybody. We won't invite anybody. Okay. It'll just be me and you. Sounds good. That's Done. It. I like it. We'll have spaghetti and roast chicken That's every awesome. night. That sounds amazing. I, I, this has been a very successful interview from my perspective. <laughs> um, okay, we're going to do my little James Lipton moment because I'm feeling very inside the actor's studio right here. Okay. Okay. So uh, it's a little word association, finish the sentence sort of thing before we open it up for questions. Italy is? Complicated. Junk food is? Uh, appropriate when necessary. <laughs> <laughs> Your favorite thing about New York is? Um, <laughs> I love the food, yeah. Best thing about bacon is? Um, tasty. <laughs> a food trend I like is? A food trend I like. Um, ice cream trucks. Hmm. A food trend I hate is? Um, hamburgers. You don't like hamburgers? I love hamburgers. <laughs> hmm, okay. Uh, food trucks are? Good some places, bad other places. <laughs> Reality chef competitions are? Dreadful. <laughs> the most surprising thing about Google to me is? Um, that it exists. <laughs> <laughs> we we're not really here. It's all smoke and mirrors. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to open it up for questions, if anyone has any. Thanks. You need to go to the mic, so please. Wow. I didn't notice that before. <laughs> um, so I have two questions, actually. Mm -hmm. The first is, um, I said I'm going to the Dutch for the first time on Friday, and what should I order? What do I have to order, do you think? 
and this you can answer that one first. Uh, you know the the if you haven't had them yet, the little oyster sandwiches are um, are are kind of tasty. I highly suggest a beer with them. Uh, and uh, you know I'm really 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 digging the smoked chicken stroganoff right now. Um, which stroganoff you don't really hear that word very much anymore, but I do from Minnesota. <laughs> It is, uh, it is available at the Dutch right now. Nice. Um, and then, how do you make your roast chicken? Uh, the roast chicken, how do, at the restaurant, how do we make it? Or how do we? How do you make it at home? Oh, how or, do we make it at home? And how do you make it at the restaurant? <laughs> the roast chicken at home is, um, is very, very simple. You take a half stick of French butter, and you put it in the cavity <laughs> with uh, malden sea salt and cracked pepper. Half a, um, a garlic uh, head cut in half, a little bit of thyme, salt and pepper on the outside, and that is it. I don't even tie it. I don't that whole trust chicken thing at home. At the restaurant, it's a different story. At home, don't even tie it. You just put it inside, and then for an hour, go watch TV or do something else. Do you salt and pepper it and leave it, let it sit? Like no. Yeah, and if you want to make a really great, like just a, the simple thing to do for roast chicken to get it really, really crispy, is put it in the um, refrigerator the night before and don't don't cover it. Yeah, that's the best way. Nice. So it gets, outside it gets nice and dry, and moisture, you know, because butter on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, I don't, I don't do temperature or anything like that. Just at home, it just again, it's just that old technique of just picking it up, and then when the juices are clear and it doesn't have the little uh, blood specks in it, it's good to go. Yeah. That's Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, I was wondering, you know, so much of a restaurant in New York is the ambiance. Mm -hmm. How involved are you in, like, the decorations of your restaurant or the plating, and how does that whole process work? Um, at, we had um, two great designers at both restaurants, uh, and probably I micromanaged too much uh, with my partners on how that gets done. Um, I know at both restaurants, a lot of the art that's on the wall, the photographs, um, the kind of like random object that's here and there. Uh, I bought myself over, I know at the Dutch, I uh, probably started like two years ago just kind of collecting things because we had this idea of what we wanted to do exactly. Um, so it's a combination of, you know, some internet finds, a trip to, you know, upstate here and there, uh, just kind of, you know, uh, uh, Brooklyn Fleet, the Chelsea Market. Uh, it's just kind of like to help tell a story of um, kind of like help I like, I, because it's the corner restaurant, both were corner restaurants, and I wanted to have that sense of warmth a little bit. So it's, you know, you have something that's like a little bit, like, a little bit funny, and then something that kind of is a nod to the neighborhood, and then something that's a nod to the cuisine, and it's just kind of, um, I just put all that together um, in a random type of way to help tell the story of the place, uh, which most people never notice, really. It's just kind of helps, mm -hmm. helps tell the story, really. Hi, how are you? How you doing? Good. Um, I was wondering, after listening to your story mm -hmm. about your experience at El Bulli, mm -hmm. spending the entire day in the kitchen, learning, talking about food, mm -hmm. if you could have a similar experience today with anyone, who would you spend a day in the kitchen with, learning and collaborating with? Um, you know, I think I, I'd, I'd love to go to... Um, it, it, I don't. I, I. I don't know if it necessarily be a chef. I'd want. I'd want to get. Uh, I'd love to go to, to Japan and fish. Um, I think is what the next thing I'd like to do really. And um, I want to get on a. I want to see what fishing is in in Japan because I've seen the the Japan's. It's such an amazing place to eat, and uh, I think I'd like to go on a boat and catch some octopus with. Like a Japanese, and I have that connection. I've established the connection. <laughs> they're they're in, a t in a town called Atami, and um, it's uh, it's the, the brother of uh, the cute Japanese girl that cuts my hair. And I am <laughs> I am going to I, well, next time we go to Japan, which is um, maybe the end of next year, I am going octopus fishing with her brother. <laughs> I, like, I like to find out where things come from and how, what that process is. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Hey, I have Dan. three questions. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I'll charge you extra. Okay. My first is, what's your favorite pizza place in New York? 
uh, favorite pizza. You know, pizza is funny. Pizza is, uh, you know, pizza. It's people have a lot of love and a lot of hate for pizza. Yeah. It's kind of like all about the pizza they grew up with or the pizza that was in their neighborhood. And you know, I I, I like Mortarino a lot. I like that. I like that style pie. Caste is good also. Um, but you know, if I want to get a slice and um, up by Columbia, La Familia is fine because it's like a slice joint. But it's a different. That's a New York phenomena. So if uh, you know, I, I enjoy, I'll enjoy one of those too. Um, but there's no excuse for bad pizza. <laughs> there's absolutely no excuse for that. Um, so yeah, Mot yeah, Motorino, like that Napolitan style, like, I really like. Okay, yeah. um, question two. What's your, what's your favorite ingredient to use and how do you feel about flavored oils and vinegars? Um, favorite ingredient to use? Um, probably tomatoes, just in general. Like, right so much you can do with that and sweet and sour and sauce bases um, in many cuisines. Flavored oils, flavored vinegar is not a big, not a big fan. Uh, vinegar is good vinegar. There's like no replacing like good vinegar. Um, it's even like red wine vinegar to have like a good quality like aged kind of French vinegar usually. Uh, we were making our own vinegar for a while uh, which was kind of an interesting experiment that led to um, lots of mold and sometimes flies. <laughs> uh, but sometimes those results are going to be, actually cider vinegar is really easy to make at home and um, it's, it can, it's, it's really easy to make at home. And if you get a small barrel and some cider, you can, you can have some good results with that. But flavored oils, eh, yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> okay. There's like chemicals involved and it's not, you can get, you know, better results just combining those two ingredients by themselves. Right. And in terms of marinating red meat, mm -hmm. some chefs don't really believe in that. Some will just do it and, you know, marinate it for hours or even a day. Some right. will just throw it on the grill. How do you feel about that? Yeah, it depends what the application is, yeah. really. You know, the if you're going to, um, like in in the book, in American Flavor, there's a, we have, there's a rib recipe that um, you uh, put the spices all over the ribs and then you put it in the fridge for six hours. That is a certain application because it's the way we're going to cook it afterwards. Um, if you're going to, it just depends. It depends on the cut too and it depends on... What if on... it's a 16 ounce ribeye? <laughs> <laughs> I asked because I've She's I'm making it tonight. Size. 16, <laughs> uh, 16 ounce ribeye, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't marinate it. I wouldn't marinate it. Okay. I, if, you have, if you have a great, if, if, it's, if you have a great piece of meat like that, you know, if you, I don't know, you went to um, somewhere and sourced something that's really great. It's, I, I'd like to rather to be like beefy, um, you know. At the restaurant, at um, at the Dutch, I just felt if you were gonna, if I wanted to open up an American restaurant, we had to make. It would be pretentious of me not to try to make the best steak we could, right. and so we spent a lot of time um, trying to source from a particular farm, and we were dry aging for 28 days, and we're doing this uh, technique called re-aging, mm -hmm. which is after the stuck because dry age. You dry age the whole piece of meat, and then you cut your steaks. You trim it up, and then you mm -hmm. cut your steaks. We cut the steaks, and then we're aging the steaks individually again afterwards. So there's more kind of dry age flavor on them, and it's just salt and pepper. So it's really kind of about the natural minerality of the steaks, and getting like a really good char on the outside, than necessarily trying to infuse it with other flavors. Like there's no, I don't think there's a reason to do like a chili rub steak necessarily mm -hmm. if you have like a great piece of meat because if, if I'm going to eat a steak, like, you know, do be like steak. I want to, I want to, <laughs> I want to, I want to taste the, the beefiness of it necessarily right. than trying to like make it taste like something else. So for yeah, steak, I try to be kind of like pure about it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Cheers. Hi. How you um, doing? So I have a question about the business end of of um, things, I mean, it's obvious, you know, you go on the reputation of your, your talent as well, mm -hmm. but you're also in a very competitive restaurant market in New mm -hmm. York City, and so I think conventional wisdom always says it's, like, it's one of the hardest businesses to go into, and so what do you think, aside from the buzz that you get as a chef and, and you know, kind of your talents, like, what else do you do to run a successful operation? Uh, it is true, you know, that, that the art of cooking is very different than the business of food. They're, it's like very, very, they're, they're different. And there's no, there's, no, um, there's no road map to success. No one ever taught me 
how to do that. No one ever, there's no, there's no book on it. They don't teach you that in school. There's no, it's, it's a lot of mistakes. I made so many mistakes. I try, the thing about mistakes is that I make 10 a day, but I try not to let everyone know about them <laughs> and just cover your track as much as possible. You know, it's a very human business. It's very, uh, I have two operating partners. One guy who um, is a, we cooked together for many years. He was a chef for me and a cook for me for many years that uh, is now moved into, he takes care of the kitchen design and scheduling, costing, organizing. Um, he builds, I mean, builds the restaurants. And then I have a, another uh, guy, Josh Picard, who takes care of kind of the front end of the business part of it. So I can do, concentrate on what I'm uh, good at, or at least what I aspire to be good at. And uh, I think that, uh, again, it's like you can have all the opening buzz you want for a restaurant, but uh, that only works for three months, four months. And then it's, you, have to, you have to be consistent in what you do. And I think that's really the, the biggest thing. It doesn't matter if, uh, if you're the diner on the corner and you do the dried out grilled piece of chicken on top of the Caesar salad you want to go back because that's what you want to go back for. And you don't want to know it's like the same, you know, every single time. So it doesn't matter if you're doing foie gras three ways or pork buns or a bowl of spaghetti or you're doing the dried out piece of chicken. It, 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 you have to be like the same and uh, try to deliver the same kind of experience. Um, and I think that's, that's the most important thing. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions, guys? You have to go to the mic, Matthew. <laughs> Maybe you should rap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Um, so I just have this perception of chefs always making the perfect meal every single time, never any flaws. Have oh, that's you... not a perception. That's how it is. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking no, about? No, I know. I know that's how it is. But have you, as a chef, you know, ever put some stuff together? Because you mentioned you like throw ingredients together. You know how much is supposed to go, to go together, and then just say, "Oh, this is awful," or just throw it away and have to start over. Oh yeah, that happens at sevens all the time. Oh, it's good to know. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no, that's, that happens all the time. I mean, when, just for when the, usually my, my process is I'll probably have, but if, if we're gonna do a menu change or we're gonna do like come up with a new restaurant like we just did with the Dutch, probably four or five pages of ideas. And it, you know, the, the, the line, the type on the computer would just be like, local something something with garlic or you know <laughs> hey let's do something with veal ribs or you know they end up being not um, you have to just like whittle down the ideas kind of and my, my formula is if one out of five ideas work then you had a good day <laughs> so just kind of have to like sometimes you know it sounds really good and um, let's try this thing but I, you know, maybe you can't get a supply of it every day, which happens mm -hmm. sometimes. Or maybe, uh, you know, I can make it awesome, but then you try to put it in the production of the restaurant making it every day, and it never works because making one thing and making 150 of something, mm -hmm. is, there, it's, a different, it's a different context. Yeah. Thanks. Hi. Um, so I sort of, differ like when I go out to eat, I sort of differentiate between times where I'm going out to eat because I'm starving and I just want a burger and fries right. versus something where uh, it's a Saturday night and I've been planning all week to go to a restaurant. Sure. And I just wanted to know if you thought there were any sort of tips or hard and fast rules for ordering to sort of get the most out of your restaurant experience, whether it's like, you know, ordering thematically or balancing or anything like that. I think it's all about context, you know, and kind of where you are. Uh, and what type of restaurant it is, or you know who you're out with, or what the purpose is. Like, obviously, you're just eating to eat. You're you know you just you're gonna get a turkey wrap and you're gonna split. You know, right. uh, I think that um, you know just the restaurant tour in me or the chef in me. Like uh, any restaurant's gonna give. Um, I I I never judge a place on one 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 try because I know as a diner just eating out so much and all over the world. It's like you can be having the meal of your lifetime and the person next to you can be having the worst experience ever. It's just kind of, it's just the theater of a restaurant and the, um, so I think the thing is, uh, you know, um, you know, there's obvious, uh, you know, on some menus there's things you could just, you know, you just look at that and you're like, that's just wrong. I'm gonna stay away from that. Um, 
and then there's the, the obvious choices. It kind of just depends on how many times you've been there. It depends on, it depends on what the mood you're in. That's why what I try to do is, is always balance out the menu so there's a little something kind of f for everyone. So I have tripe on my menu, mm -hmm. but I also have like a quinoa salad with squash and, and hazelnuts. Just depends on it depends on what night it is. Are you like balling with like your, your buddies and you're doing tequila shots, or you're like, <laughs> did you go for like the 82 Bordeaux and like or it just sort just of depends. go with your gut a little yeah, bit. Yeah, just go with you know, just go with your gut. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So I guess this is a little bit related to how you as a chef, you know, dine out. Mm -hmm. um, I think all of us that dine out a lot, you end up with sort of your pet peeves and stuff. I was just curious, what drives you nuts at restaurants that you go to as a diner? Um, I think it's the, the 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 biggest thing is just like not, not caring. Um, that's the that's it doesn't it doesn't matter if it's the Greek salad or it's right. the uh, it it it's just blatantly not giving a shit um, <laughs> is really kind of like the it's that's the thing that's like always and again mistakes are going to happen. You know, there's going to be you know someone's going to you know they're going to open up their oyster and there's going to be a little sand in it or there's going to be maybe a little bit too much salt in your steak and that's happened that's the human aspect of it it's just like i just blatant attitude or you know just I, that that just like drives me crazy and you can feel it sometimes when you sit down you know you can just you can feel mm. you can feel it right away so that's that's the biggest thing yeah thanks yeah. okay uh who are your favorite green market suppliers when you're taking that wine sap out of the walk-in? Uh, where do you like it to be from? Um, you know, I've, I've um, been buying from the market here since I first came to New York and just as a being, working in restaurants or whatever in the early 90s. Um, they're usually there every Wednesday. Um, you know, uh, Franca at Berry Treasures is you know, my we we buy a lot from Franca, and we buy a lot from Rick Bishop. Um, you know, uh, the you know the wine. I'm fortunate enough also that I actually don't have to physically go to the market to get those things, because uh, we they're both pretty busy restaurants, and um, we pay cash to the farmers, <laughs> so they uh, they like to deliver to us. Um, so, uh, but you know, Millerelli, um, Franca, Buried Treasures. Uh, uh, those are kind of like our go-to, go-to people, and then we have like you know one or one or two that could get us just stuff that um, they don't even put out the green market because they know we're gonna we're gonna sell it right away or that's what I want. Like if someone's gonna bring us like local chanterelles the one month they're in season or local huckleberries the once they're in season. Um, I've always you know bought a lot from the market even though I necessarily don't use that as a marketing plan. Um, it's kind of like I don't know I think if you're a good American chef, or just a good chef in general. That's what you're. That's what you're doing these days. Good. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, guys? Okay. Well, thank you so much cool. for this. It's been really fun. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. <laughs>